It's April 5th, 2010. We're at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, where Duke is leading Butler by two. In the closing seconds, the Bulldogs have no timeouts, but they still have one final chance at winning the national championship and upsetting Coach K's Blue Devils. If you're unaware, we're about to witness one of the greatest finishes in college basketball, which will overshadow everything that got us to this point. So many of y'all have been asking for this one. So finally, let's rewind. Like a slingshot aimed at a biblical behemoth's head, Butler has one shot to do what many thought was impossible. Forgive me for embracing the cliche of sports cliches, but that's how this matchup was billed coming into tonight. It just definitely didn't do the Bulldogs justice. While they lack the basketball legacy of Duke, Butler didn't simply come out of nowhere. After a 35-year absence, they made their second NCAA tournament in 1997. That sparked seven straight seasons of at least 22 wins, including four more tournament invites and the school's first appearance in the AP poll. They were a team capable of pulling off the scrappiest of upsets. As a 10 seed, they beat Wake Forest in 01. As a 12 seed in 2003, they knocked out number five Mississippi State and number four Louisville. In the 2007 tournament, they made it to the Sweet 16 where they forced overtime against the slightly stacked eventual champion, Florida Gators. They followed that up with the school's first 30-win season, and a very good Tennessee team also needed overtime to beat them. After that, they suffered a slight dip, but with a roster made up entirely by underclassmen, there was a degree of overperforming. They came into the 2009-2010 season ranked 11th in the AP poll, seemingly assured of winning the Horizon League. And while they did drop out of the top 25 after an 8-4 start, they haven't lost since late December. For the second time in four years, they're a five seed and have more than proved it wasn't a fluke. A lot of the credit for Butler's turnaround goes to head coach Brad Stevens, both during this season and over the last few years, who I will say one last time is not just some local child who won a contest to become coach. I don't know who started that rumor. Please stop. He's so much more than that. The former marketing associate for pharmaceutical giant Eli Lilly joined Butler as an assistant in 2001, then took over ahead of that first 30-win season. Stevens led a physical, defensive-minded team into the 2010 tournament, and it seemed as though they'd forgotten how to lose. They dodged a first-round upset by outscoring UTEP 50-26 in the second half, courtesy of Shelvin Mack getting hot from three. They squeezed past Murray State thanks to a Gordon Hayward deflection that prevented any last-second shot. Butler's first trip to the Elite Eight happened after their defense frustrated number one Syracuse, forcing 18 turnovers in a four-point win. Against Kansas State, they actually gave themselves a little more breathing room than normal and became the smallest school to make the Final Four since 1979. And by choosing this year to make it that far, they conveniently headed back to Indianapolis where they'd be playing just 30 minutes away from the Butler campus. Against Michigan State, they needed all the home court advantage they could get. In the final 12 minutes and 18 seconds, Butler was held to a single field goal and barely shot 30% for the game. But after the Spartans intentionally missed a free throw, Hayward gathered the rebound and the win was theirs, making it 25 straight. It was the lowest shooting percentage by a winning team in the tournament since 1958. But they also became the first team in the shot clock era to hold their first five opponents in the NCAA tournament to under 60 points each game. And while Butler fell just shy of making it six straight, Duke has needed to grind just to keep their slight lead. Part of why it's this close is that the Bulldogs have forced the Blue Devils to not look like the Blue Devils. Few have done that all season and it definitely hasn't been the case during the tournament. Baylor came the closest in the Elite Eight when they took a one-point lead with 3.50 to play, but then let Duke pull away to win by seven. Every other victory was by double digits, which included a 21-point win over West Virginia to get them to their eighth championship game under Krzyzewski, but just their first since 2001. While this might not have been Coach K's best squad, they were still extremely good, it just hadn't fully translated yet. The core of Kyle Singler, Nolan Smith, and John Shire became just the second Duke trio to combine for 600 points in a season. And before tonight, at least one of them scored 20 or more in every game of this tournament. The trouble for them was that this year was the first time they made it past the Sweet 16. 
Last year, as a two seed, they were plastered by Villanova in a 23-point loss, which was actually a drastic improvement from a year before. Again, as a two seed, they had to come back against Belmont to win by one before losing in the second round to West Virginia. And when John Shire was a freshman, they lost by two to VCU in the opening round. So for all they've done this year, a loss tonight would further cement the disappointment that's been their Duke careers. And against Butler, we've seen some of what has undone Duke in tournaments past. They've struggled to pull away like they usually do. These teams traded the lead 15 times, plus another five ties. And Duke's largest lead tonight has been just six points. They hit that near the end of the first half, thanks to an eight nothing run. At that point, Stevens took a timeout and Butler responded by scoring seven unanswered to retake the lead. Then late in the second half, Duke kept Butler from making a field goal for nearly eight minutes. But the Bulldog defense prevented a Blue Devil run and held them to five points in the final seven minutes of the game to give Butler a chance in the closing seconds. A chance made somewhat easier thanks to Matt Howard completely taking out Kyle Singler. But earlier tonight and leading up to the game, it looked like Howard wouldn't be here, which would have deprived us of this incredible screen and I guess would have deprived Butler of much more. Howard's been a key piece for the Bulldogs since he took over the starting center job as a freshman. He won the Horizon League's Newcomer of the Year award, and the following season traded in those honors for Horizon Player of the Year. And in 2010, he was named MVP of the conference tournament. But in the NCAA semifinal against Michigan State, he got knocked around a bit, including an inadvertent Draymond Green elbow to the forehead. He played through it, but after the game, it was announced that Howard suffered a concussion and his status was uncertain for the championship. That wouldn't have been great for Butler, who needed his size and smarts to handle Duke's 7'1 Brian Zubek plus the 6'10 Plumley boys. And while Howard managed to clear concussion protocol and started the game, he still found himself on the bench most of the first half thanks to early foul trouble. As he sat, Avery Jukes filled in who in his previous seven games had scored just seven points. But tonight, the former transfer from Alabama became Butler's leading scorer of the first half and hit this three right before the break to make it a one point game. The second half mirrored the first. The score stayed close and Howard was back on the bench early after picking up his fourth personal with over 14 minutes to play. But when Butler needed him most, Howard was there. He brought an end to their field goal drought with under two to play, then on their next possession, got it again and made it a one point game. But between then and now, it feels like an eternity has passed. That's partially because it's such a high stakes game where every moment matters and momentum seemingly swings with every touch. And because Butler burned all their timeouts. With 30 seconds to play, Butler brought the ball up court for what could be the final possession. As they attempted to find any open man, Zubek deflected a pass out of bounds, and Stevens took a timeout ahead of the inbound. He put the ball in Hayward's hands with 13.6 remaining, but Coach K stationed Zubek in front of him. Stuck in the corner, Butler went back to the drawing board with their final timeout. The second time around, Howard inbounded and got it over Zubek's head to Hayward, who had eyes for no one but himself as he took it to the baseline. He got off a fadeaway that had just a touch too much on it. Zubek collected the rebound and headed the other way to ice the game with a pair of free throws. But after he made the first attempt and extended Duke's lead to two, Coach K had different thoughts for his second shot. Krzyzewski knew that with little time remaining, Butler likely couldn't advance the ball far enough for anything but a three. So instead of giving them a chance to gain ground off an inbound, he had Zubek intentionally miss. The trouble for Duke was Hayward skied for the rebound. It's definitely a gamble regardless of opponent, but considering who has the ball in their hands, it's extra dicey. Let's talk about Gordon Hayward. Not too long ago, that name wouldn't have meant much to those of us not from Indiana. Hayward went to high school in Brownsburg, about 15 miles outside Indianapolis. It was there that he nearly gave up basketball for tennis, then had a 10 inch growth spurt and beat the buzzer to win the 4A Indiana high school state finals his senior year. But with that success coming late and the fact he had skipped basketball tournaments for tennis tournaments, Hayward was an unranked three-star prospect without much interest from major programs. 
but he drew the eye of a local college and got a scholarship offer, which he took partially because their morning practices wouldn't get in the way of his computer engineering studies. Outside the classroom, the accolades started coming his freshman year. Hayward became an attraction within the Horizon League and even during the summer helped Butler gain some respect. Alongside Clay Thompson, Seth Curry, plus fellow Bulldog Shelvin Mack, Hayward helped Team USA's under-19 squad win a world championship in New Zealand. He carried that success into the regular season where he led the team in scoring and displaced Howard as the Horizon Player of the Year. But tonight, he'd likely take a do-over. He shot just two of 10 before the closing seconds and had already missed an opportunity to retake the lead moments ago. But he's earned a rare second chance to help Butler pull off the upset and after seasons spent flirting with success, make a statement win for the university. Otherwise, it's Duke hanging on for their fourth national title under Krzyzewski, and a win that would completely rewrite the narrative of Singler, Shire, and Smith's time as Blue Devils. With time running out, the ball in Hayward's hands, welcome to a moment in history. It's Hayward pulling it down, getting around Zubat at midcourt, launches the shot, oh, and almost went in! went in and Duke is the king of the dance. Thanks for watching Rewinder. For an episode with a slightly more successful buzzer beater, check out this battle between the Knicks and Heat. Or here's another one of ours that you might like more. Make sure you subscribe to SB Nation, tweet me a screenshot that you did, and I'll send you a coupon book in the mail.